Welcome back to another daily walk. It's a daily sit these days, but you know. <laughs> if you watch some of the old ones, you'll know why I chose to sat down. I, I love the scenery behind me and stuff, but the walking was, you know, I enjoyed it, but I, I think some people did not did not necessarily. So today I want to talk about uh, that fascinating time in the Bible when Jesus' authority was challenged. This is a rare one because I actually pulled out a scripture verse to read uh, specifically. Um, and the reason I want to talk about this is because I, I've been talking uh, quite a bit lately about the church growth movement and, and things like that. And, and the reason I'm doing that is because I'm starting to see a whole lot of, like, there was a period of time it was clear what was a church growth movement type stuff and what was not the church growth movement type stuff. Uh, there was a time when all that stuff was 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 kind of clear, but but as as those guys have not been challenged as old, um, I'll use the word heresies were. What happens is that uh, people are starting to. Um, you know, people are just starting to assimilate all their teachings in because, oh, they're, they're good Christian guys. And I hear that all the time. Oh, good Christian. This is a good Christian guy, a good Christian show, a good Christian band. A good... No, stop it. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. Okay. You can be a secular musician and still be a Christian. I have a whole lot more respect for that person than I do a person who says, I'm a Christian and, and, and all this other stuff. And then you start uh, spouting off weird things. <laughs> And um, what struck me is uh, I'm reading uh, I'm reading in Matthew right now, and um, I read Matthew 21 starting in verse 23 today, and I just thought this was so fascinating to read. It says, when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching. He said, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? So of course Jesus is used to being asked about his authority. But uh, the Pharisees hated asking him these questions because they always turned it around on him. So Jesus responds, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was the source from heaven or was it from men? So they're trying to trap Jesus. And in light of all this, Jesus also does this thing, which is effectively trapping them. Because they have this little conundrum. If they think it was from the men, from if the baptism of Jesus was from man, then they're, they'll be concerned with the people because they could regard him as a prophet. But if his baptism was from a prophecy, then what are they doing putting a prophet to death? And that's exactly what they started to say among themselves. They began reasoning amongst themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say for men, we fear the people, for they will regard John as a prophet. And so in answering Jesus, they said to him, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, what does this have to do with the church growth movement and things like that? Now, we get into the parable of the two sons next. Understand that the scripture, uh, one of the things that our modern society and our modern Christianity has done is it gotten us into the realm of one verse Christianity, where we pull out one verse that sounds all nice and wonderful and, ooh, it's so inspiring, but it's completely devoid of the context. So all of that is in line to bring up the further context. So he goes into a couple parables. First is a parable of two sons. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go to work in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. And the man came the second time, and he said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? Okay, so they said uh, the first. And Jesus said to them, Truly, I say to you, um, that the tax collectors and the prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you, for John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe in him, and you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward, and so you believe in him. And so in light of all of that, he's really rebuking them for their lack of belief in who he is, while the prostitutes and the sinners came to him um, um, they did not. And then he goes right into another parable. And this is the fascinating one. Um, this is the parable of the landowner. Of course, I'm reading from the NASB. It says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press and built a tower. Now, that is actually a quote, um, a quote from the Old Testament. Um, 
and that is significant that he does that. He says, he rented out to vine growers and went on a journey. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. And the vine growers took his slaves, he beat one, he killed the other, and he stoned the third. Again, he said to a select group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son saying to them, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the error. Lost my place. <laughs> this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? Okay. Then they said to him, he will bring those wretches. This is the Pharisees and the this uh, the Pharisees, the people challenging him, uh, coming to him. And he says, they said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. And Jesus said to them, do you never uh, read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. And this came about from the Lord and that, the mar uh, that it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, just as Jesus still speaking, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And who falls on the stone will be broken into pieces, and on whomever it falls, it will scatter them like dusts. All right. And then uh, verse 45 says, When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they understood he was speaking about them. And when they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. Why do I mention that? What does that mean? The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to others. And that entire parable is about God owning the vineyard, the, the place where the gospel is preached, the, the people in the world. And the Pharisees and the priests at that time started to pervert God for their own ends. And he says, it will be taken from you and given to others. And it was taken and given to essentially the church of the apostles and the spreading of Christianity. But then something happened in that, you know, for a while Christianity was in little pools and that was slowly conglomerated together. And then we had a rising somewhere around six to 700 AD, this Holy Roman Catholic Church. And then, of course, there were some splits and, you know, the Orthodox moved off of theirs. And then what happened is we had little series of the Reformation of people who actually understood the scriptures and got into the scriptures and said, what the church is teaching us is not right with the scriptures. And so they said, it is better for us to be persecuted than for us to obey the church as it perverts the Bible. And this starts the Reformation, and in a little pools of Reformations, of course, Martin Luther's the most famous reformer, um, who didn't really want a Reformation. He's one of the, he's the most famous in the Reformation, but he's one of the only ones that didn't really want a Reformation. He just wanted Rome to correct a few points. Um, you know, 95, but, you know, a few. Um, Calvin really wanted that full Reformation. The Pilgrims wanted Reformation. Wycliffe wanted Reformation. And these guys sought out to have a Reformation. And it kind of brings up this, we don't rebel. In fact, it was one of the, it was on one of the trailers, for, was it Rogue One, I think? I don't know. One of the trailers, unfortunately, this part was kind of the movie, is, this is rebellion. I rebel. Now, that's such a bad attitude, and that's not the heart of what it means to rebel. To what it means to rebel is that I cherish my freedom or I cherish my truth or I cherish my God more than I cherish my life and I'm willing to die for it. You don't rebel because I rebel. It's such American, Western, first world, whiny attitude. We rebel because we'd rather die than see God perverted in the context of the Reformation stuff. And so the Reformations occurred, and the Protestant Church broke away from the Catholic Church. And what eventually happened in America, particularly, is really where this started with this spread of denominationalism. Is is what tended to happen now is is that the people got out and they, um, you know, it, it got to the point where uh, where people would we start putting too much faith in the church and too much faith in the pastor and too much faith in in the curriculum 
and not enough faith in the Bibles themselves. And we're in this one verse culture and we have no concept of what is biblical Christianity anymore. And so what happens is as we start questioning what is biblical Christianity, we start digging into the scriptures and we look at what a lot of the church growth teachers have been teaching us and it's not consistent with the scriptures. And this is why I say we need another reformation. A reformation that brings us back to studying the scriptures with an understanding of what the scriptures are and, and who made the scriptures. Not this piddly little one verse, I don't, I'm going to leave this church because the music is bad. No. We want to question the churches to say, teach us what the scriptures say. Teach us what the scriptures say, not what your plan is, not a business strategy, not a vision strategy, not a leadership plan from the up, upper up, and, and then all of the people are just the little sheep who are following the leaders of the pastors. No, he who wants to be first must first be last. And this means that we need to get in and understand that we are to be servants not creating a vision for our church and then preaching that to our congregations to follow. A good church teaches you what is in the Bible. And it teaches you to follow God in the midst of all of that. And that's what we should be seeking, is true churches that are not giving us their plan and their vision, but encouraging us to find our own. So thank you for watching this Daily Walk. If you'd like to help support what we're doing, check out ourwalkinchrist.com forward slash support. I have some books that you can read. I have Testing and Temptations is a book about sanctification. And this book will, will uh, walk you through the steps of salvation and, and what that means and how we are to, call, uh, to continue and live our life in Christ. Then I have another book, which is called The Art of Shallow Neighboring, which is a parody on some of this first world Christianity, uh, particularly about one, one book. And I include in there a very uh, a very deep discussion about um, about what uh, you know the various things that the original book uh, got incorrect. So thank you for watching, and I hope that you enjoy your daily walk with Christ.